All right, hey everybody, and welcome to Chew Stream, where we talk about art and life as an artist. I'm your host, Bobby Chu, and uh, today we also have, of course, my co host, Matt Johnson, on here. Hey, Matt. Hey, Bobby. Hey, everybody. Right on. And uh, if you are watching this right stinking now, you caught it live, so it's interactive. And if it's your first time catching a live interactive stream, you can go to slido.com hashtag chew stream and you could ask questions and it's interactive and today's topic okay today's topic that i would love to hear from you about is common artist nightmares artist fears what are you scared about and and uh how do you deal with it i know i've had my share of fears so uh i'd oh, love yeah. for that to be the topic for today Absolutely. I mean, I think fears is just one of those things that really cuts to the heart of how you can improve. What are you scared of? Tackle what you're scared of. That'll get you on the road to success for sure. Totally. And uh, before we get started, I also want to, I want to start off on a positive note. A few weeks ago, a stream or two ago, I was mentioning some success stories that we've gotten over the years for Schoolism and how inspiring they are, not just for us encouraging us at Schoolism to work harder for you, you know, everybody, but also for the community themselves. Just hearing how people are succeeding just makes you feel like you can do it as well. So today I have a special one uh, I'd like to read for you guys right now. This one is from John Banda. Dear Bobby, I am now a graphic designer, video editor, and manga artist because of the leap of faith I made from having to experience your videos. That's awesome. Uh, I was doing a degree in business studies and IT before I realized that I can't half-ass my goals. I wanted to pursue the arts in film and manga. So I made a leap of faith to pursue my artistic goals by making a design portfolio, which got me hired since ultimately your portfolio determines y you getting a job, not always a degree. I dropped out of college and fully actualized these crucial steps because of one of your videos. When I decided to move forward, I remember you talking about your life experience, working as an IT guy quitting your job and having your hard drive with all your stuff crashing and thinking, maybe I should go back and get my job back. Uh, I love the fact that you didn't and you continued on, not half committing due to fear. You know, full commitment, that's what it's all about, guys. That moment made me do the same without looking back. Things actually turned out okay. I'm currently working as a designer and in my free time doing 3D modeling, drawing my comic, and working on my artistic goals. I managed to do all that even in a country like Zimbabwe where what I did is considered an anomaly. I'm truly grateful for all your artist interviews because making career decisions is just as important as getting good at the art. Thank you, and I hope to see you at Lightbox Expo in September. Keep up the good work, Mr. Chu. Much respect, John Banda. Big shout out to John Banda. That's yeah. awesome. So encouraging to hear. And you know what? Of course, it's very encouraging for us to hear that us getting on the streams and you know sharing uh, our thoughts and our, our experiences and things like that. And I've been doing this for over 10 years. You know, it, it really helps to encourage me to put these kind of things in more of a priority, you know. Uh, so if you have a success story, you know, whether it's from taking schoolism classes or workshops or, uh, or from some, something from these videos, we would love to hear from you. I'd love to hear from you. And perhaps yeah. I just might read it on the streams. You can contact us. You can email me at info at schoolism.com. And to encourage everybody, I have something special for everyone. Okay? So for, for John Banda... I'm going to reach out to him, and uh, if I read your story, you are, you're going to get this as well. Okay, what is this? This is, let me see if I can, let me see if I can get it to focus in. Ah, there we go. 
It's a little plant people pin. Well, I think it's backwards on my screen. But it says reaching. It says reaching because we're all reaching for our goals, right? And you can't buy this pin. This is a special pin. I made this wow. pin. And it's got cool gold foil and stuff. So it's legit. It's high quality. And on the back, this is backwards again because I guess my video is a little funky. But I will read it to you. It says, just like plants, dreams need constant, constant care and effort in order to bear fruit. So you got this tiny little pin here, reaching for the sun, and so it's called cool. reaching. I like how he's sitting on the little mound there in the illustration. It's not just centered up on the thing. It's very nice, Bobby. Yes, and uh, you know, big shouts out to the wonderful Casadera for doing the art direction on these pins, oh. and Masay Seki for doing the the uh, backgrounds. Um, these pins, it's just for positive vibes, people. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, you know, it's like, it's just to kind of share some good positive vibes with everybody. So, uh, John Banda, I'm going to give you one. And, you know, for everybody kind of helping to encourage positive vibes and stuff, uh, I'll send you one as well if I read your story on one of the streams. That's All right. Cool. Even cooler because they're not for sale. That's awesome. That's a true collectible right there. You know, I really, these days, I kind of really enjoy the stuff that I don't have to do. <laughs> you know, it's stuff that I just want to do just because I want to do it. Because which... there's just so much of your day that is just you have to do it, right? <laughs> and you're, right, you're yeah. Crazy. I wish, yeah. I wish. Um, yeah, but... <laughs> it, it's definitely, you know, like when you have to do something, then it becomes, it feels more like a job when you're doing something because yeah. you just want to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it just feels like living, you know. That's so cool. So, uh, yeah, would love to hear your questions about your artistic nightmares mm -hmm. out there. And yeah. uh, I also want to mention one other thing real quick. Concept Art Awards. This is an award show that's uh, just starting, and it's going to start at Lightbox Expo. So if you're a concept artist, if you do concept art, if you do you know, cool art in general, check out conceptartassociation.com and uh, take a look at the awards. Maybe there's something that you want to submit. It's all for free. It's all for the art community. And if you come to Lightbox Expo, you can come to the award show for free as well. Seats are limited, of course. All right. We're back. We're back. <laughs> so why don't we go on to, do we have any questions yet? Now? We have a few questions. We've had a few questions come in already. And yeah, I really think that uh, any questions that you guys have out there about your nightmares, your artistic fears... We'll try to tackle some of those first today. Um, I There's one right here from Anonymous. Uh, if you want to go, do you want to go ahead and go into the questions, Bobby? Yeah, let's, let's do that. Okay, Switching it up a bit. Here we go. How do I get over burnout? I'm afraid that one day I don't feel anything when I pick up the pen. That's a big one. Yeah. Uh, it, it is funny because um, I didn't really think I needed any kind of break at all. And, you know, I feel like I'm a person that can deal with stress very well and, and high pressure and just lots and lots of work. But I do also, I, I've also seen kind of like days where I noticed I'm not in such a good mood, right? Um, or days where I'm just different. I just feel different. And a lot of times I feel like much of it comes from stress that I might not consciously be feeling, but it seeps out, right? Mm. It seeps out from different kinds of things that I might be doing. Um, or, you know, like uh, the soup was cold and now I'm just like ultra pissed about it. I don't know. <laughs> You're just dehydrated. You just need some water. <laughs> yeah, but it's it's not because of that. It's because of something else. So right. um, I I feel like, the thing with burnout is so much more relevant nowadays than it was maybe 20 years ago. 
um, because there's so much distraction, there's so much to engage with, uh, and we're kind of always on. We're mm-hmm. always grabbing that that cell phone. You know, um, you know what I heard? I heard that. So to answer your question first, I meditate. I love meditating and uh, exercising. You know, just exhausting myself with exercise just makes me feel great. By the end of it, I don't have to think about, or I won't think about all of that other stuff I got to do because I'm just so tired. Or meditate, and I know that's difficult, you know, especially when you have a lot of stuff to do and you're sitting there not doing any of it and you're just sitting there doing nothing. Yeah. I've been there. I mean, like, it's like a muscle like anything else, right? Like, if you can't do it for, if you can't sit still, I think, for like a minute and just like kind of chill, then that's the place to start, right? Like, do it for a minute. Yeah, no, totally. Um, I do guided meditations because, or that's what I did in the beginning to get into it. Because cool. I, I, I'm not one of those people that likes to meditate. I don't want to sit there. I'm just, when I'm sitting there, nothing's happening. I don't feel like I'm achieving anything. I'm not getting anything done. But with a guided meditation, you don't think about that as much because there's a person talking to you, telling you what to concentrate on now, you know, bring it back, get away mm-hmm. from those distractions, you know, like that kind of stuff. Um, headspace, that's a great one. Mm-hmm. I was on uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza's uh, guided meditations, which I thought were fantastic uh, as well. So there you go. Yeah. Be, and, and the other thing is, if you are not into meditation, if you really aren't, get into boredom. Mm. You know, have, have scheduled times where you will be uh, away from your phone no social media no screens even and just sit there relax and let whatever thoughts come in your head come in your head and let them pass and just be an observer you know and a lot of times you you will come up with you'll start thinking about things that are going to be very helpful for you this happens to me all the time you know you don't think about whether or not you need batteries for your remote when you're staring at batteries in the supermarket, right? You think right. about you think about these things at the wrong time. So a lot of times these things will come up when you're bored. Mm-hmm. And I've heard that, um, don't quote me on this, I'm an artist, <laughs> but I'm going to tell you some scientific thing I, I heard. And that was when you meditate and you, or if you're, in some cases when you're bored, it helps to develop uh, chemicals in your brain that um, it's like it, it helps with the outer kind of layer of your brain that, yeah. uh, I, I don't know, it's helpful, it's helpful. Yeah, so, it helps you calm down, right? Yeah, yeah, and if you're always on your phone, if you're always on, like you, you never get those times to develop, uh, you know, healthy chemicals yeah. and help, healthy cycles. Yeah, and like the switching time, like between tasks, I think is something that really can be exhausting. Like if you're trying to multitask too hard, you don't really ever get to concentrate on that one thing that's most important for you to do. And you lose, you know, hours in the day just between uh, putting one thing away and getting another thing out because you're just kind of overdoing it, right? Oh, wow. Yeah, I don't know. I love multitasking, oh, yeah. uh, Matt. <laughs> it, the only thing is I don't do them at the exact same time, right? I right. like shifting gears very quickly. And I, I literally like shifting gears very quickly. So I'm very conscious of how long it takes me to go from one thing to the next thing. There you go. So you're not losing that time the way some people may lose that time between. Right. And I'm sprinting. It's like I'm on these mm-hmm. multiple sprints all the time. Okay, I only have an hour to do this. I'm going to work on this and I'm going to switch to this thing and so on and so forth. But the mornings, the mornings are my morning. You know, I get up real early. Nobody's up. And mm-hmm. I, I exercise or meditate or both. Mm-hmm. 
And so can I connect that back to the burnout and just ask you, is that to say that when you have fewer distractions and you have these stretches where you relax your mind, it helps you to prioritize a little better, helps you to kind of take inventory of what's important there that you need to go do and and you're not too much on a grind? Is that kind of how that works together? Uh, I kind of feel it, I kind of feel like it's, it's, okay, it's kind of like your thought process, my thought process, if we can imagine, it's, you want it to be like this eight lane highway, right? Mm -hmm. Like this amazing Autobahn where you could go as quick as you can. Um, but then when you start thinking about multiple things, maybe it's, oh, I need to remember that thing later, later, not right now, but mm -hmm. I'm not going to write it down. I'm just going to say, I need to remember that. And all of a sudden, it's like now there's a little uh, slow car on your highway. Okay, now I got to go around that thing, right? And so on and so forth. So um, you want to keep the highway clear. And so mm -hmm. you can do that by... Uh, making sure that you have nothing that you need to remember. Everything's written down. Everything's put in a place where it will turn up when you need it to turn up, um, like a to-do list. And the other thing is that, uh, you know, when you go through your days without rest, without meditation, without calmness or boredom, there's all this other stuff on the roads, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and just meditating, exercising helps to clear all those things away so you can think real fast, real good, and, you know, high-level quality thinking doing these that sprints. That makes sense to me. Yeah, keeping the lanes clear and not having to remember things has helped me a lot. That's a great piece of advice. And you just um, feel happier. You know, you just feel, like, really ha naturally kind of happy uh, for exercising. I don't know anybody that's exercised a bunch uh not and they weren't injured or anything but not happy that they exercised i haven't heard of anybody like that <laughs> right no one ever regretted getting six-pack abs right yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um there's a couple more questions here that are great um anonymous asks um i worry that i'm spreading myself too thin this kind of goes with what we were just talking about but I'm worried that I'm spreading myself too thin. I love many styles and many media and worry about disorganized looking social media to boot. Any advice? Disorganized social media, that's that's a real thing. Mm -hmm. You know, like I was just looking at my social media and I was cleaning it up uh, yesterday. That was something that um, the incredible Jamila Kanaf, uh, she told me, she was like, she does housekeeping on her social media. And her social media, it's like over 200,000 followers or something. So, yeah, believe it. Keep it organized. Uh, you have too many styles, too many different media. Uh, well, too many styles. I have a solution for that because, you know, I have, hopefully I have more than one style. I think I do. Oh, I definitely do. What am I talking about? Um, and a lot of times, that's what they hire me for. They go, oh, I love what you did on such and such's movie. I want you to work on my movie, but I don't want you to make it look like the same style, right? Because this is my movie. And that happens all the time. So you have to constantly change styles. Um, and how I did it was, it's like, the whole entire thing about style is it helps to identify you, it helps to create your brand, but it doesn't always have to be your style. Like, what do I draw, Matt? Mm -hmm. What What would you say that I draw or you whatever? Fantastical creatures. There you go. Yeah. Yep. You can make it a topic as well. Mm -hmm. You know, and then sometimes the work speaks for itself and it's kind of like, oh, you're the person that did X. Y and Z, uh, those are fantastic, so I'm going to hire you. Uh, I would, if you're just starting off, though, I wouldn't try to do all of the different things. I would just try to do, concentrate on one, maybe a second thing. 
So one mm-hmm. being storyboarding, and then the second one, maybe it's animation. I don't know. But, um, and most likely, I would just say just one thing if you're starting off. Get that one thing under your belt. Get it to the point where you're not just okay to get an entry-level job, but you're, you're at a point where you can get a pretty decent job doing that. And mm-hmm. then tackle the next thing, right? And now you want to do painting. Great. Do your painting. People will look at your storyboards and go, okay, yeah, I kind of believe him or her because the person knows how to succeed in this genre of art. Let's try this one. Yeah. Do you think there's, I mean, there's a difference too between like, um, I like to play with watercolor sometimes and I'm going to try to be a watercolor artist. Like there's two totally different levels to that, right? Right. Yeah. (laughs) So it's like, if you're going to focus on storyboarding, like as your like career path, you don't want to focus on multiple career paths. Is that what you're saying? And then it's still okay to dabble in those other things. But if you're thinking about like where I'm going to get a job, you don't need to be going in six directions, right? Well, yeah, what I'm saying is, and there's many different ways to do everything. Okay. I'm Mm going to give you my way, what I think is the most logical and why. And I do feel like this is the most logical way to start off with one thing at a time because you kind of, like, I imagine it as spinning plates in the, you know, on a stick in the air or whatever. You don't want to try to start off by spinning four, (laughs) right? You want to start off by just spinning one and getting used to just that one and getting really good at it for before bringing another one on and getting really good at that one before bringing another one. That's a great analogy. That, that clears that up in my head. <laughs> that makes yeah. a lot of sense. And you'll, yeah. you'll stand out way quicker when you're just focusing on one thing, laser focus on that one thing. Your ability to do that one thing will, will increase. It will get better uh, exponentially more than if you were concentrating on three different things and trying to get good at all of them. That's a great way to look at it. Um, let's go to another question here. Yeah, and also, Matt, um, if I remember you might have oh. some as well. So if you <laughs> want to go to yours, uh, because sure. you wrote down a few that you thought might pertain to other people as well, right? Yeah, I did. I think that um, these are... Some of these are a little universal. Some of these might be specific to me, but uh, I thought I'd bring up a couple. Uh, the first one is the fear of rejection. Uh, and it, it's a kind of universal, but I also wanted to put a twist on this because we talk about rejection and, and how, you know, you got to try anyway. And I think people are kind of aware of that. Um, I think that there's a twist on this, which is wasted effort. And I would love to hear your opinion on this more than my own, please. But I feel like sometimes there's a fear of wasting your effort. Like the idea that you might get rejected means that you shouldn't even try. Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, So one thing that we want to get out of our heads is um, it's not about getting a yes the very first time. It's about having that, that determination to keep going through a bunch of rejections before your yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That it's not wasted effort, right? Yeah. Yeah. Getting those is part of the process. Let let me just explain something, you know, to the people that are listening. Mm -hmm. How many things would I have accomplished if I took no for the answer the first time? I would have accomplished nothing. I wouldn't be an artist. You know, did Mm -hmm. I get into my art school the first time? No. Uh, Post-grad? No. Did I get a job? No, 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 no. (laughs) Um, And, you know, like uh, a lot of these amazing artists that I've gotten to get to know and and, uh, teach on schoolism. Nathan Fowkes took me over two years trying to convince him to teach on schoolism. If I took no for an answer the very first time, there would be no Nathan Falk's schoolism courses. Uh, and then Craig Mullins reminded me that I, you know, uh, I asked him consistently for over a decade. 
Wow. That's the power of not hearing no. <laughs> you, and you never know why that you got that no, right? Like it, it's not because you weren't good enough for the opportunity or that he didn't want to do it. Oh, I know why, actually. Yeah, right? he said it wasn't the right time. See, there you go. So the thing is, it's like, you know, how many of these things would be different if I took a no for an answer uh, and then just went away and never mm. came back? Man. Because it's not even those people eventually saying yes. It's more like because those people said yes, then all of a sudden, and then they had a, you know, a, a great experience teaching on schoolism. Then they introduced me to this other person and that person said a bunch of no's. I kept going and then that person eventually said yes and that was per person's happy. And then, <laughs> you know, the cycle yeah. continues so, so far beyond what we would usually think. And so that's why you, you have to consider that effort for the first one, part of the process of getting to the 10th one. Absolutely. And, and think about, okay, what is your ultimate goal here? Your mm -hmm. ultimate goal is to have a great career, right? What if I told you, you can have a semi okay career and never get a no, or you can have an incredible historical career, but you would have more no's than yeses. Wow. But you would achieve amazing things because of that. So many. Uh, you have to take that one. Yeah, it's just, <laughs> it seems like there's not another option. And that's, that's life, right? That's, that is life. Yeah. So, you know, the rejections. Are you afraid of getting rejections? Are you afraid of succeeding? Because that's the path to success. It's, oh, that was my, paved. that was my next one. The fear of success. Please talk about that. The fear that of success. The next one on my list. Uh, what, why would somebody be f afraid of success? There's a lot of reasons. Uh, you may just feel like there's now you're part of something you can't live up to. Um, you may feel like it's, uh, going to change your life in uncertain ways. I think that some people hold back from really going for it because in a lot of ways that would take them way outside their comfort zone. I do remember me thinking if I really, really tried and I gave it my all and I failed, that would be worse than trying, like n not trying my fullest. That's yeah, what I was thinking, wow. right? But um, I also remember telling myself, okay, you know what? Don't be afraid to fall in love with your art. Let's go. Let's do this. And I almost, wow. you know, like that was an actual conversation I remember having in my head and then going, okay, we're going to jump in with both feet and we're just going to get absorbed by our love of art. And the other thing it was I found like I needed to put in just as much effort like a normal, you know, uh, husband or wife relationship, boyfriend, girlfriend or whatever. Uh I needed to put an effort into this this relationship that I had with art, right? I had to put an effort to love art as much as I wanted to love art, if that makes sense. It does. That's a really amazing way to put it because we live in this era where you can you don't have to love anything and you don't have to like you don't have to work hard at a thing. Like you just put this one app down and you go get another app or uh, you don't like this show on Netflix. There's 5,000 other shows on Netflix. So you don't have to work at anything really like you do a relationship. And it goes back to uh, the little pin that you showed us at the beginning, how you have to love it and you have to care for it and you have to do that over time. And it takes effort, which is not something we're used to doing unless we've been married or in a relationship for a long time uh, or very far down the line in our career. We don't have that. So you're you're making things click for me over here about that. I like that. I have yep. another one over here, another fear to share with you. Love it. Let's do it. Uh, feeling like an imposter. Uh, and this is my way of saying uh, that you don't see the sweat that goes into other artists work and where they are in their careers. And you only see that it's hard for yourself. And so 
you kind of feel like an imposter in that way. Does that make sense? First time, um, you know, I, I worked on, I think, six movies before the first movie came out. The other five are all canceled. Mm. Uh, the sixth one was Alice in Wonderland with Tim Burton. And when that came out, it became the number one movie in the world that weekend and ended up being the number four most grossing you know, movie in history for its time. Now it's like, I don't even know. Now it's probably, how many Marvel movies are there? <laughs> so it's probably <laughs> like around like 20th place now. I don't know. <laughs> uh, or even more. Um, but the main thing I wanted to say about that experience was when I watched the movie, the first thoughts in my head was, wow, that really looked like a real movie. That, that was the thought in my head. <laughs> Talk about imposter syndrome, right? Oh, wow. I'm watching this thing. I'm just like, yeah, it, it really does look like a real movie. Hmm. <laughs> you know? <laughs> uh, you pulled one off. You pulled one over on all of us. Yeah. You faked us all out, Bobby. <laughs> the other thing is that uh, hopefully this will give some people a little bit more... Uh, I don't know, make them feel a little bit better. The fact that most people that I interviewed over my 10 plus years interviewing, you know, great artists, most of them say that they feel like an imposter. Mm. There's only a tiny handful that don't. I could tell you like, uh, I think it was like Ken Ralston. He doesn't have imposter syndrome, but he was also... He didn't just work on uh, the original Star Wars. He was a supervisor of special effects on mm. freaking the original Star Wars, you know? So we're all kind of <laughs> children of this man. Yeah. Uh, and he has, you know, 14 Oscar nominations or something, won like four or five of them. <laughs> At some point, I think you can. <laughs> yeah, it went away. It went away it went after away. a while. Yeah, so one of those Oscars cured him of that one. But yeah. generally, everybody else does. Uh, so ma majority of everybody else, I do. I could tell you, like, I have it under control because I know. Okay, yeah, everybody kind of feels like this, but I do too. Mm -hmm. I feel like, do I like this painting? that is on screen not really mm -hmm. um there's things about it that i like but there's a bunch of things about it that i don't like um but whatever you know like i know that's kind of just how it is mm -hmm. yeah so in that regard like but you see the finished product of someone else's art and you don't see that whole journey that they're going through in their head so it's important for people like me to remember that uh, you go through it and Craig Mullins goes through it and, and all these other artists go through it and uh, just kind of reminds you that just because you feel like that, it doesn't mean that your artwork is showing that really to others. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're all on the same path and that's, that's a really important part about why I do, you know, why I've done these interviews with other artists for so mm -hmm. long so yeah. that you can see the human side of them. You know, it's then, so important. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I have another one here that I'd love your thoughts on. Um, now, you know, uh, the lady from the Tonys, uh, Ali Stroker, that was in the wheelchair, won the Tony Award this last week. Um, this is a good example of overcoming this fear. And that's the fear of perceived limitations. And I think perceived limitations such as age or where you're located or um, a certain skill that you don't have yet and how those fears make you not try as hard or make you feel like it's not something attainable for you. Does that make sense? It totally makes sense. Uh, living in Toronto, Canada, starting my studio here, you know, Toronto's pretty good. It has a lot of production, but doesn't have as much pre-production in the kind of stuff that I want to work on. Mm -hmm. uh, so I definitely felt very limited that way. As well, I couldn't get a job in the beginning. You know, that's, that's a big part of why I started 
a studio in the first place is because I couldn't get a job. Mm. Um, I didn't know anybody in the industry. You know, all these things. There's a lot of limitations. Uh, I'm starting Lightbox Expo. You know, mm -hmm. the, this giant event in Pasadena, California. I don't live in Pasadena, California. I want to change the art community. I want to change the art industry for the better. You know, talk about shooting high. Mm -hmm. So do I think, am I, am I kind of like nervous about it? Do I feel like, um, like I took on too much? Do I feel like I can accomplish these things? You know, now that everybody's looking at me to do these mm -hmm. things, <laughs> uh, I could tell you, like, uh, very honestly, there is a small part of me where it feels like, oh, my gosh, can, can this happen? Can we actually do this? But it's very much controlled. Mm -hmm. and, and that's just because it doesn't matter to me if I could do it or not. I feel like it's logical. I thought about it. Okay, this is a logical thing that can happen, and it could happen if you take these steps and you work this hard. Okay, well, uh, will it happen if I do it? doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Because uh, if it's logical, then that's your, that's your green light to go and do it. That's your green light to put in the effort and the time and just start doing it. Whether or not you can do it, I, I feel like if you're worried about things that are out of your control, that's gonna bring way more stress and, and just mess up your life <laughs> in general. You know, uh, you won't be able to think as clearly and things like that. I don't, I don't think about those things. I think a, a big thing that would help a lot of people out is if they change their kind of definition of success. You know, change your definition of success into am I trying my hardest? Am I putting in the time? And am, am I kind of constantly looking at the direction I'm heading and thinking, is this still the right direction? So in other words, are you using your logic? Those are the only things that you can have full, full, full control over. So if you're doing all three of those things, in my books, you're succeeding. Whether or not you get the job, whether or not the person will like your work, all those other things uh, doesn't matter. Because if you're constantly doing that, it will lead you to a career full of success. And I could tell you, when I first started the studio, people thought I was crazy. When I was starting the online school, schoolism.com, people thought I was crazy. And when I said I was going to you know, rent the Pasadena Convention Center and have the ultimate mecca of uh, artist gatherings in the entire planet. <laughs> People had their doubts for sure. A lot of companies had yeah. their doubts too. And I needed these companies to sponsor the event, right? But um, when, when you have this undying kind of thing in your eyes, in your, in your mind where it's like, no matter what, this is happening. And I will go, I will die before I give up. You don't have a limitations mindset at all. Like, it, that's how I feel about it. And a limitations mindset is hard to overcome. Like, how do you feel like you overcame that? Or if did you ever have that where you were like, oh, I can't do this because fill in the blank or has that just not been part of your nature that has been part of my nature I, there was a time where i was thinking i just want to uh work in a television studio you know whether it's working on i wasn't thinking about working on the best thing in the world i was just mm. hoping to be an artist you know but like those are the people that will encounter a lot more kind of trouble in their careers i feel Hmm. You know, when you when you settle for something 
very very low and that's, that's your that's your bar of success yeah. yeah like at the bottom it's pure turmoil it's pure rotten people that want to take advantage of you jerks that that um don't have their hearts in the right place and all this stuff you don't want to stay near the bottom if you climb your way to the top and then you fall a bit you're still like not at the bottom you know and there's still going to be nice people around you and things like that uh that's that's kind of how i see it yeah that's great um we have a few uh nice questions here that aren't exactly fear related but uh, sure. I'm going to ask a couple of those, too. We've got some, a lot of upvotes from everybody, so we want to make sure we're giving you some advice you want. Um, Jane H. asks, when learning from online courses, how do you know that you're progressing to the right direction? How do you get critiques from experienced people? Thanks. Thank you, Jane. Yeah, thanks, Jane. Uh, well, one is your own view of your art. You're going to see it evolve. You want to be able to see it evolve. You want to be able to see it improve. And then um, if you still don't know, there's always the Schoolism Facebook group. If you're on a Schoolism class, then you can uh, join in on the Schoolism Facebook group. And then you can uh, you know, upload your assignments. And it's just full of wonderful people that give uh, thoughtful critiques. You know, mm -hmm. so... Of course, you also want to contribute as well. So don't just post stuff there. Comment on other people's stuff. Try to you know, give them a good, honest opinion, things like that. It's all about community. And that's what I loved about those art forums back in the day. You know, it's all about community. It's all about growth. It's all about uh, giving each other helpful, constructive criticism. And it wasn't just all about pats on the back, which it kind of is now. Yeah, that makes sense. And you can always, you know, um, weigh in on someone's art without feeling like you're going to hurt their feelings by saying something like, um, you know, this isn't my painting, but if it were, this is something I might think about. And just kind of approach it in a nice, gentle way. If you're not used to giving people feedback, it's a great place to go and practice. Uh, very circle of trust there. Um, another good one here. Uh, what is something that you've learned from Claire Windling? Love her art. Uh, the thing that I, I love about Claire Wendling, and for those of you that have never seen her art, definitely check it out. Claire Wendling. Mm -hmm. um, the thing that I, I really love about her art and her as a person is she's really like an artist's artist. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's like every... Like every artist has has respect for her. It it really feels like that. Um, yeah, you, you want to be Claire. Like I wish I could draw like her. <laughs> I mean, just straight up love her style. Yeah, the thing that I I really got from her is uh, kind of like how people really respect her work and how she doesn't really give give a shit about things that a lot of other artists might give a shit about. So for example, um, there's this thing that happened in Angoulême, Ben Disney, the, the comic con that happens in Angoulême, France, uh, where years ago in the comments. Um, but the gist of it was that they wanted to give her an award. Okay. And this is a huge award. What I'm not sure of what I believe is true is that it was a national award, right? It's a very important award from her country. And the whole entire thing was so that uh, before they wanted to give her the award, there was a big kerfuffle about the fact that the awards in the past have always been given to men. Oh, wow. And then all of a sudden they want to give this award to Claire. And then Claire said, no, I don't want your stupid award. <laughs> you know, <laughs> love That's that. So cool. I love she's that. Like the, she's like the Bob Dylan of the art community. <laughs> yeah, because she's just like, I know why you want to give me this award. It's because I'm a woman and you wow. want to save your tail. Well, I don't want your stupid award for this stupid reason. You know, keep wow. it, right? 
That was really cool. Just standing by your your you know your beliefs, things like that. I I love that about Claire. It seems like she automatically creates things and just like has pages and pages and pages of drawings all over the place and I'm jealous of that lifestyle of being able to just automatically just churn out drawings. It's it's beautiful. Well, yeah, this is the other thing. Her art, so unbelievable. No reference. All the reference is just bottled up <laughs> inside her head. You know, she'll just start <laughs> drawing, and it's incredible. It's, yeah. It's awesome. Um, this is a popular question from Pablo Santana. It's hard to know what brushes art teachers are using in schoolism classes. Uh, is there a way to get those brushes? And greetings from Colombia. Thanks, Pablo. Let's see. I can see that. I mean, I, there's some, some of these artists have their go-to brushes, right? And generally everybody, offering. yeah, generally everybody talks about their brushes and says, you know, what they, um, how they use it, and what, what it is. Yeah. I wonder I which like, class he's talking about specifically. Um, yeah. Yeah, I don't. I don't really recall too many uh, teachers that that use very very customized brushes. Um, but I could kind of break down a lot of these brushes into something a lot simpler. When you think about it. You know, great traditional uh, painters, they didn't have a tree brush, you know, a, a rock brush, and so on and so forth. They just had brushes. And a lot mm. of times they, they wouldn't use like 20 different brushes to do a painting. They might use just a few different brushes. And really, some of them, they're just using different brushes because now they have a bigger size brush. You know, so texture can be done with anything. Uh, the kind of brushes that I would recommend that you would have. One is something where you can paint very flat, smooth colors. Okay, so it's not textured. Another one where it's very textured. So then you can have uh, kind of static in your, in your brush strokes, right? Creating texture. Mm -hmm. And... That's pretty much it. After that, you mess around with opacity, mess around with flow, so you can control your different types of transitions. And that's that's pretty much it. Yeah, and I like to just piggyback on that and remind people about uh, the fact that like there's people like John Hardesty who does his entire class on textures that it's not about the brushes that he uses as much as it is like his understanding of what a texture takes to be created does that make sense bobby totally the way that he uh categorizes the different types of textures really helps yeah. you to learn how to think about textures like what is the shininess of the texture the specularity what is the overall kind of silhouette of the texture you know is it going to be smooth right yeah um and a bunch That's of a different good. categories. I think there's like six or seven different categories that he uses for you to, to help people to mm -hmm. think about texture. And Kyle brushes being part of every Adobe Photoshop out there now is really cool. Those are great brushes. Yeah, Kyle brushes, right on. Totally great, great uh, mention there. I use those pretty regularly now, and it's all free. Yeah, it's awesome. Um, a couple more questions here that are really good. Um, the one that has risen to, risen to the top, Bobby, is what do you look for to hire in an artist? <laughs> uh, well, technical skills for sure. Mm -hmm. If if they don't have good ideas but they have really good technical skills, that's still somewhat okay. But if they have really good ideas, because it's kind of a secret, um, I guess it'll just make everybody make it even harder for people to get hired because then I'll know that's out there. <laughs> okay, so the last part is learning how to deal with failure, with 
rejection. Mm. I think pretty much everybody I've said no to the first time or the first few times. And yeah. it's up to them to keep coming back and not giving up and always coming back in a new way, being, yeah. being innovative, you know, and, and being positive, you know, like, hey, sometimes it's just not the right timing, just like Craig Mullins, you know, 10 years mm -hmm. ago, right? I just kept mm -hmm. positive, kept coming back, polite, try to, you know, check things out in a different way, trying to get in there in a different way for over 10 years. And eventually it worked out. That's great. Yeah. There's, there's a couple more great fear-related questions I'd love to ask you, Bobby, uh, from the crowd here. Um, all anonymous. You people should give me your names. We'll give you a shout-out. Um, I, I, are you ever afraid of mediocrity? Uh, I have a hard time finding inspiration, and I feel bad I might end up doing the same things as everybody else. I think that's a great fear. I have. I remember that fear. I don't yeah. have that fear anymore because I feel like I've built up a pretty decent um, kind of brand for myself, a name for myself, so I know mm -hmm. where my art is. Um, but I definitely remember that kind of fear of me mediocrity or like just kind of fading into the noise. Nobody will notice me. How do I get out there? How do I get people to notice? Um, but I could tell you one thing. Once I stopped thinking about that, and once I realized, hey, you know what? If I learn enough about something to a certain level and become a smaller percentage of people that can do that thing, then eventually the whole world will have no choice but to notice you. And that's exactly mm -hmm. what happens. You know, if, it, if you should have been known five years ago because of where your skills are at now, reassess how you're kind of putting yourself out there, number one. And number two, if you are putting yourself out there in a very logical way uh, and it should be working and it isn't, that's okay. Once, once people do notice you, you'll blow up five times, ten times, even more, even faster. Mm. I've seen this yeah. lots of times. There's what about like, this? Yeah. Sorry, don't let me interrupt you. No, I was going to say, like, I've seen it many times where it's like one person, they are putting themselves out there when they're... That, that is where I would put myself. I would put myself into that category. Or I was putting myself on the internet and everything. Uh, before I knew a lot of stuff... And then people saw my career grow and then they feel more connected, right? And, and you get more kind of followers or you, you start growing a band of followers from, from a long time ago and they grow and grow and grow. And the other way is uh, all of a sudden somebody finally freaking notices you. <laughs> <laughs> and then that just spreads like crazy. I've seen that. <clears throat> many times like a really well-known artist finally catches on and goes holy yeah. smokes check out this person yeah Boom. i feel everywhere. like i see i feel like i see those instagram accounts sometimes where i'm like why does this person only have 500 followers when this is like i, I this person should have fifty thousand followers and then one day it just pops something happens and they just spread um a, the second part of this question was like about maybe afraid of being of doing the same things as everybody else um can you talk about that a little because i'm still learning myself about like you don't want to paint it if you feel like everybody else painted the same thing or a type of the same thing what advice would you give that's there? that's amazing that's a really great point because yeah that's definitely happening a lot more uh mm -hmm. the things that dif differentiates a lot of the artists that stand out is some sort of secondary or uh, tertiary interest, you know? So for example, your interest might be in um, Goya paintings, you know, but you're making a video game, right? How can you extrapolate what you love about Goya paintings and apply mm. them 
to the style of the video game, perhaps. Very cool. Right. Mashing things up like that. Yeah. Uh, and every time you learn something kind of off the beaten track uh, and learn how it works, learn the history behind it and everything, and you apply it to your art, then then all of a sudden people are like, oh, shoot, I didn't. That looks awesome. And that looks awesome because it came from some sort of honest place. It came some, from some sort of like real facts, real info applied to your imagination and it gives it substance, you know? That's like great. get really interested in whatever. Like get really interested in gloves. As a, a, as a example, gloves are not the most kind of interesting thing. Mm-hmm. But say you got really, really good at all sorts of different types of gloves. Yeah. Leather gloves down to like machine kind of mech kind of like hardcore gloves. If you did, uh, people will notice that because it's unusual. It's not like the regular thing. There's going to come a day when someone needs the glove expert. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's true yeah hopefully, hopefully you know but yeah. like like a costume designer or somebody you know i mean you never know where that that kind of thing can take you yeah and i i pick gloves because that's like some sort of thing where a lot of people might be like why would that be important how could that <laughs> possibly help me but let's just change it to something that um i'm saying that example because i'm saying anything mm -hmm. most likely will help you quite a lot uh, if you just learn the snot out of it, and you really, really uh, learn to understand it to the point where you can do it without even looking. You can teach other people what you know, how that thing works, and what it is. Um, but think about if that thing wasn't a glove, and instead you became you love motorcycles, right? Mm. And you get all into motorcycles, and you really understand the anatomy, the guts of like a motorcycle from a sports bike all the way back to like the the first original you know bikes yeah right that becomes very valuable and it makes that's, your art very different that's so important like i think it's it's really easy to to look at like superhero character art or pinup art or fan art of video games and it feels like a very crowded space but if you can just bring something you're interested in to the table that's like, well, where'd that come from? You're not part of like the mainstream anymore, just automatically. You're already just doing you. And that's the best way to do it. It's probably the most sustainable way to do it as well, I would think. Because you're not kind of, oh, I'm going to do this popular thing uh, that everybody else is doing. You're doing something you really love. That's cool. Definitely. Um, and I think... I think this video is done. Is this video oh. done? I don't even know. <laughs> Such a creepy painting. It is. But um, yeah, the cool thing about this painting was that it was totally subconscious. I just oh. kept painting. And I think I was watching American Ninja Warrior or something. <laughs> I was just painting something for the stream. And that's what it ended up being. So I thought that was mm -hmm. kind of cool. Anyhow, uh, I hope everybody enjoyed the stream and definitely remember that if you have a success story, a schoolism success story uh, from you know, learning from schoolism classes, from workshops, mm -hmm. or from these videos, uh, something that we can perhaps share with the other people in the art community, send them to info at schoolism.com. And if your story is selected and is told you know on one of these streams then i will give you a special little thing just from me to you which is this little plant people pin <laughs> so cool yeah can't buy it anywhere and it's just something fun um doesn't mean i won't sell it later on i don't know <laughs> maybe because i i did make a bunch of these and you can now, be the first, though. Now I'm thinking, how long is it going to take to get rid of all these? <laughs> but, uh, yeah. yeah, there you go. That's all awesome. right, everybody. So <clears throat> thanks again for watching. And a uh, big shout-out to my co-host, 
Matt Johnson. Thank you so much, Matt, for hanging hey, out. Hey, thank you. I learned a lot today talking about this. Thanks a lot. My pleasure. All right, everybody. Take care and have a wonderful day. Now, a huge part of the success of this channel and everything that I do is because of you, the listener. So thank you. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel and then press the notification button because that way you'll get instant notification the next time I put out a new video. Thank you very much.